Thank you, <clears throat> thank you all. Uh, Rosie, help me with the math. Uh, you weren't here in 86, but you've been here 20 years. It's not been that long, has it? Just a few years ago, right? Uh, you get to the point where you think 20 years isn't that long, but uh, it is great to see so many good friends, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to reminisce a little bit, to think about context, to think about what's the same, what's different, and <coughs> I wish for some of you who weren't there, uh, as, a, as I may be so bold, as some of you are a bit younger than I am, that, uh, that you'll gain the colleagues and friends in this struggle that we have, and we've had some in this room, that uh, can really enrich your life. Uh, the clients we work with, uh, those who've struggled to find a better life in a, in a country that promises equality and freedom and often fails to do that. Uh, and those who join in the struggle and, and do this. So I'm thankful for you being here, and I wish for you uh, that same <coughs> breadth and richness of friends and colleagues in the struggle. And thank you for the opportunity to think about some of those folks and, and, and to be together with them. Uh, in many ways, we live in a different world. We call me few, if any, computers. I remember the first time I looked at uh, Regina McGraw here, showed me a C drive on an old box that was called a computer. And uh, we both laughed was, that we would never. I was 10 at the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our math isn't very good, Rosie. It just uh, does not work. No internet, no social media, no webinars, no Skype, no cell phones. We went to the immigrant filing center and missed the document and tried to call back. We always had to leave with quarters in our pocket because we had to run across the streets of a 7 Eleven or someplace or find a phone that was working to call. Uh, so again, trying to think about that kind of world, it, it may be hard for some of you who are glued to your little s screens in your hands and your pockets, but, uh, but at the same time, we faced an immigration crisis. Uh, we were told there were three to four million undocumented persons living in this country, and somehow this was wrong, and somehow we needed to change things. Um, as today, uh, then, there were folks who saw that as a problem from two different perspectives. One, that somehow we had a leaky border that was not secure, and we were being invaded. Um, and others seeing about, what are we doing in a country that attracts <coughs> individuals here, living in a second-class status, and we can't find a way to make them full members of a society promising equality and justice. So there was hope for reform in the air, if that sounds familiar at all. And so let me provide, as I've been invited, to some context for that. I want to talk about three basic areas that uh, we connected into the what we actually did. But one's the national picture, one is the local picture, and one is the service providers and resources. So if you permit me, I'm going to do a little bit of each of those. And uh, for many of you, this will be old hat. Others, I hope uh, it'll be interesting in a sense of what was really going on. During the Jimmy Carter administration, there had been uh, set up a select committee on immigration and refugee policy, as CIRP, uh, chaired by <coughs> Hesper, who was uh, the former president of Notre Dame. Uh, it was a rather large committee and tasked with the sense of, uh, if we had immigration reform, what would it look like? And they published their first <coughs> findings in around 1980. <coughs> And they came up with the hallmarks, which eventually became part of the Immigration Reform and Control Act. But it <coughs> interestingly provides some impetus. If we think Congress is deadlocked now, gridlocked, doesn't work, uh, this committee forced Congress to hold the first joint hearings on immigration reform since 1951. So that was even 30 years that Congress had not really looked at major reform. There had been enactments in 65 and things like this, but to have a kind of reform. So at least there was that hope that somehow Congress was looking at this issue. Uh, Simpson, Senator Simpson from um, Wyoming, he was very active in immigration. One of my favorite quotes from the legislative history was uh, Senator Cranston from California once questioned why Senator Alan Simpson from Wyoming was the leading force in the Senate on immigration reform. And he said, Senator uh, Simpson, he says, you know, there are more undocumented persons living in California than citizens living in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because immigration was sort of a backwater issue. A guy like Simpson became really powerful and, and really forced a lot of this. And so uh, it's important to know how these things happen. And Mazzoli had, uh, I believe, from Kentucky, um, 
And so they put together what would became uh, the first simpson mazzoli proposal in 1981. And there are three hallmarks, okay? The theory was wipe the slate clean and cut off the magnet. So we're gonna have uh, legalization, so all the undocumented will get status. So we get rid of that group, now we're starting with a brand new clean slate and we'll cut off the magnet. We'll create employer sanctions, make it illegal for anyone to work in this country unless authorized or born in this country. Think, ah, idealistically, if you cut the magnet off, you clean the slate, there'll be no more immigration problems. That was, that was the thought process. And to kind of act as a little bit of a lubricant to get the whole thing working, we appeased the agriculture industry by agreeing to a special agricultural worker program to uh, legalize agricultural workers. Well, as you can imagine, that had a lot of supporters and a lot of opponents, as, as today. And nothing happened in 81. It, it uh, a lot of talk, a lot of hope, and died. Oh, one other key thing. They were afraid that, like you hear today, if we, if we legislate reform, uh, people outside our borders are gonna come here while we're debating this. And so we're gonna cut off applicant eligibility. <coughs> so this bill would be 1981. You had to have been in the country January 1, 1980 to be eligible for relief. So already you see the seeds of undercutting the program. We're not gonna wipe the slate totally clean. We're going to have a group in there that will not be eligible, but be that as it may. So here's where it's familiar, right? Immigration reform in the air, right? We're going to have to do something. All of us service providers, with well, a few of us service providers, we've got to gear up, we've got to train, we got to, and then bam, the wall hits. You can't do anything, right? Um, over the next several years, again, Simpson Mazzoli gets proposed again, proposed again, something happens, it goes down. Uh, Always, our hopes were dashed. The community, we get the community excited, and it's not happening. Community excited, not happening. Sound familiar? Right. Uh, I remember getting on a plane in the fall of 86 to go to an immigration law conference in Los Angeles, or California, or San Francisco, and it was dashed again. Thursday or Friday of October week, and it's not gonna happen. Uh, lo and behold, Chuck Schumer, now a senator, then a representative from New York, had a kitchen cabinet meeting in his kitchen, in his apartment in Washington that very weekend, met with Leon Panetta and Harold Berman and worked out a compromise on the SAW provisions. And by the time I landed in San Francisco, Erica was born. So October 86, we now have a law. Whoa, that was an amazing meeting. I was good, I was a lot of National Lawyers Guild lawyers. What are we gonna do now? <laughs> we've got the reform we've been asking for, right? Uh, but several issues faced us. Uh, remember that one year of eligibility? Well, Congress um, somehow never got around to moving it much. It should have followed one year every year we went down the road, but they moved it to January 182 and never brought it up to January 185. So now we had five years of folks who weren't going to be eligible. So much for the clean slate, right? So much for that issue. Um, so that's one problem. Second, many of us were fighting the employer sanctions. Many of us thought this was one of the first bills Congress was ever intentionally legislating something that was going to lead to discrimination. If I'm an employer and I'm going to face criminal liability for hiring an undocumented person, I may say I will not hire anyone who looks or sounds foreign born. Whatever that means, right? You know, I might go to jail because I hired 10 blonde haired Swedes, but I thought they looked like Americans. But no, this is going to really affect um, persons of color persons with foreign accents. So we didn't like it, we're still fighting that. So that advocacy element was there, right? Third, they, they put this new thing in called Qualified Designated Entities, QDEs. Now, as Roy Berg and I read the law at that time, uh, and I think if any of you read the law today, it would say that the QDEs were allowed to be re recipients of filings to help the numbers. We were gonna, in fact, be surrogates of the INS, accept the applications, file with us, and filing with the government. The INS didn't read the law the same way. So we had to make major decisions about, as legal service providers, were we gonna be QDEs and be seen by the immigrant community as part of the INS, or were we gonna be advocates on the other side? And that, that was really a major decision-making process that we had to spend a lot of time working our way through. At the same time, we had to plan two different ways of service, but I'll get to that in a minute. So this QDE thing was really a big issue. Okay, what are the numbers? Three to four million potentially eligible. We thought there'd be three, four hundred thousand in Chicago at least, and who knows the Midwest area. Um, 
And, um, oh, by the way, Congress gave the INS six months to implement. So from October to May, <laughs> figure out how you're gonna process, issue regulations, and that gave us six months to figure out. So that's the, the cool part where I met a lot of the folks in this room, is that the next six months, we were all sitting around going, Galen, what are we gonna do? <laughs> how are we gonna do this, right? Um, and one year, so from May of 87 to May of 88 was a total thing. So that's the national picture. Locally, some other stuff was going on, which really was kind of exciting. And um, you may remember a congressman named Harold Washington. Uh, when he was in Congress, he did not like employer sanctions. In, in uh, 85, he wrote a letter, he made a statement, he critiqued it, he said, quote, I oppose employer sanctions in any form. I believe that we will witness a greater increase in discrimination if sanctions are adopted based on the results of the current INS program in Chicago called Operation Cooperation. So we had, a, we had a congressman who, like us, thought employer sanctions was gonna cause discrimination, and he was not being very shy about letting people know about that, okay? Um, he, um, this is a great quote, I think we need to often use this with, with our Congress folk, especially maybe now. Racism is too firmly entrenched to be legislated away. When institutions or laws encourage it, the roots are deeper and more pernicious. We all in this room know the horror of racism in this country. And when you start to legislate laws that are gonna encourage <coughs> racism, we have some problems. And, and Harold Washington knew that and saw that. So we were getting reform we wanted, but we were also getting this horrible package of employer sanctions. Now, here's where the seeds of CCIP started. Uh, as, as Washington became mayor, and, um, and started seeing how things worked from the local level, um, the community groups spoke to him. The community groups organized. At San Lucas United Church of Christ, they got together and said, you know, this is not working for us. Uh, you may remember that the FBI did a taxi fraud investigation, went into city files to look at all the taxi cab licenses, and oh, by the way, they took down the names of any of the undocumented drivers and gave them the INS. City Council Corp, James Montgomery, Harold Washington were outraged this is um, On top of that, Washington's experience, several of his, uh, if you don't know, Mayor Washington, first African-American mayor in Chicago, also had a very diverse cabinet. He brought minorities into this cabinet. It's just exciting this change and the breath of fresh air in this city. Um, but even some of his Hispanic staff and cabinet members, Maria Serta, a U.S. citizen, was stopped by the INS into her city office. That's what it was like. And that outraged Washington, as it should all of us, right? And, and so he issued Executive Order 85-1, notice that the first order of 85, which the city would not cooperate with the INS in enforcement of the immigration laws. Probably, I don't think it's the first executive order in the country, but it was one of the first. Uh, where Mayor Washington said, I will not let city officials give documents to the INS. I think INS was happy with that? No. So we've caught a little, we've got a little bit of tension in this city, but good tension, right? Um, no agent or agency shall request information about or otherwise investigate or assist in the investigation of citizenship or residency status. Residency status. <laughs> just recently, probably Lawrence, maybe the ICDR did it. That we now have the ordinance. It's no longer just an executive order. We now have the city ordinance. So uh, you all are part, part of that. But that's part of that history of getting there, right? And when he issued the executive order, here are the seeds of CCIP. The first thing he said in his press conference was, I acknowledge the importance of working with community organizations to forge a policy in response to these controversial incidents. So all of you out there are representative of these institutions. You've got to thank yourselves, because if our work as community organizers hadn't done it, it might, he went better angry, but he may not have been pushed it. But he recognized your work first. And so I think that's important. Um, and so he and the INS district director had sort of a real, not a friendly relationship. Okay? So that was part of it, okay? The INS was not happy, so they raised the stakes, okay? Uh, the Tribune quoted the INS director, A.D. Moyer, that Mayor Washington's policy, quote, hindered INS efforts to track down, excuse my language, illegal aliens and said, quote, immigration officials responsible for the raid on the taxi drivers 
said cab owners will be vulnerable to repeated raids unless, unless they lobby the Washington administration to change its policy against cooperating with federal immigration authorities. Publicly threatening the mayor of Chicago, publicly getting folks to lobby, or will use the power of investigation to crack down on undocumented? That was the tension that was going on in this city. And, and thanks be to God for how Washington for his strength to say, I'm doing what's right. Now, there's one other quick thing, and, and it's a little bit of history, but I think it's important for where we are today. Some of you may recall or read about council wars. So a lot of our city council didn't like an African-American mayor, and the council really went to war against the mayor and had a majority vote when he first was elected to stop all of his initiatives. This is kind of good work for us. And then, thanks to a federal court order, there was one war that was remapped improperly, and so a new election was called. And Harold Washington had his candidate, and the, the bad, well, excuse me, that's a joke. The other folks had their candidate. <laughs> and it was a very tough election. Seven days before the election, the state's attorney, who at that time was a man named Mayor, or excuse me, Richard M. Bailey, had a press conference. He had arrested seven individuals, six who were Hispanic, and alleged <coughs> voter fraud. Six days before the election. And guess who was standing with him at the press conference? A.D. Moyer, the district director of the INS. Harold Washington was outraged that not only was A.D. Moyer wanting <coughs> people to lobby him, they were now, does this ever sound familiar? Intimidating voters from going to the polls? My recollection is none of those seven were ever eventually convicted of voter fraud, but it was just the front page there of Hispanics being arrested for voter fraud seven days before the election. Fortunately, Harold Washington's candidate won, and you may know the name, Luis Gutierrez. Even then, one of our friends was involved in this. And Luis gave the mayor the 26th vote in the council. So how these things move and change, right? Um, and so, uh, we went on. Now finally, I'm gonna finish up because we're ready to get to our stuff. Service providers. We're fortunate now to have the NIJC. We're fortunate now to have Catholic Charities. We're fortunate to have a lot of organizations that have strength. In <coughs> but let me tell you the, kind of the picture of what we had. But before I get there, a couple of quick things about this law. As a lawyer, this was one of, uh, Roy Berg was a lawyer on the staff at TIA at the time. Ruth Dunning was a paralegal at first on the staff. Um, on one day, you had to shift your whole mentality. All of our work representing undocumented up until May of 1987 had been, no, Your Honor, this person was here lawfully. No, they're not deportable. No, that doesn't apply. This remedy applies. No, you can't deport them because we've done this. Under this law, one of the ways to get eligibility was you had to be unlawfully here prior to January 1st, 1982. So now I'm saying, Your Honor, my client was unlawful on December 25th, 1981, <laughs> right? We were, and the government was like, no, no, they weren't. They, they, we, uh, and one of the things in the old days, you had to register every year, certain things, you had to do certain things in school, all kinds of things, and we would be making arguments. They failed to register, therefore they were unlawful, <laughs> which I never would have made six weeks ago. <laughs> so there was a little bit of cognitive dissonance, well, but it sure was fun trying to think of all the ways to make my client illegal all of a sudden, right? Um, and, and people like in this room, we're doing some burning and all, we're all just trying to think, some great legislative litigation around the country. But that, just think of that, okay? Secondly, this is a little different. I hope maybe we can get this and then it can reform now. But the applications are confidential. The, the government couldn't use the application to deport you if, if you had made a mistake or something. That encouraged people. Remember, we're trying to get all lawful. So um, I haven't seen anything proposed like that today. Today, with our horrible system, there's so many ways that you can be removable that um, it, it scares people, right, in a sense. And that was one nice thing to work. So we had basically three legal non uh, providers. Legal Assistance Foundation, but the Reagan administration already limited what they could do with, with immigrants. We had Catholic Charities uh, that Bernie was involved with, and Travelers Immigrants Aid. And uh, as, as Lauren said, I directed uh, legal services in the Midwest Immigrant Rights Center. Now, you also remember, in 1981, the, the wars in Central America had really started to explode. Uh, Archbishop Romero was assassinated. 
Uh, one of the reasons the Midwest Immigrant Rights Center was started was precisely because we had so many refugees fleeing the violence of Central America that our small legal staffs couldn't <coughs> do the work. And so the Midwest Immigrant Rights Center was started to, to try to attract pro bono attorneys to do asylum work to allow our overworked staff and underpaid and overworked um, to do the regular immigration work. But we were still facing that those wars didn't end on 86 or 87. So we still were trying to do the asylum work as well as do this sort of training. We typically at TIA serve about 10,000 clients a year, and we're now looking at 100,000. We're trying to think how do you turn a system around without computers, without all this stuff, to serve what could be two or 300,000. Uh, we also were, were trying to figure out um, where should we be the QD? Did we want to be associated with AD Moyer? And we were fighting what that even meant. So all of this was in, in, in turmoil. And the regulations were not finally issued till probably, Roy, correct me, the week before, the day before. So we're trying to teach staff without regulations. And, um, and so, all, so all of us were scrambling. What we're gonna hear about now is a lot of the community groups, some did refugee resettlement, some did work, but a lot of them didn't do legal work. So here's the seat of CCIP. We've got a mayor very interested in the community groups. We've got under, staffed legal service, those three legal service providers, um, and we came together to try to figure out what we can do as a united community. We had Ed Silverman, who is a real hero in this story, who had done so much work with refugee resettlement in, the, in this state, uh, bring together state resources. And so just think of that. I think we were one of the first coalitions in the country, state, city, and the community groups. We had the church groups, churches. Uh, Galen's agency was one of the early ones and we've been long involved in this, but um, we also worked with the Illinois Conference of Churches downstate because all the agriculture workers that those of us in Chicago forgot. So the Illinois, uh, they hired Suzanne Brown to start their immigration project with Mary Carolyn Dana, and uh, we worked with Olga Salmon, another heroine of the movement uh, for the farm workers ministry. For the, it turns out I think about 1.8 million saw nationwide applicants were, <laughs> in Illinois was um, high with those saw the special agriculture workers, Roy Berg, I think you probably reviewed almost every saw application that you filed. So uh, I don't have much hair, but I would have had even less if I had to do that. So um, that Randy Pauley, Mary Colbus from the cities, uh, Al Rady, uh, and the like, uh, Ed Silverman's group, uh, Sid Moan from TIA, uh, now Harlan Alliance, and uh, another name you might know, Cecilia Munoz, that Bernie will talk about, but she was hired to direct the legalization program for Catholic Charities. Uh, Putting that together, one final thing, A.D. Moyer wasn't stopped, had, did not stop trying to interfere with our advocacy. And, I, and this is a message I think for all of us. Um, he tried to divide and conquer us. He'd pull off a few favorite agencies and talk to them on the side and say, well, we'll process yours, we'll get it done. At one point, he told TIA, us, me, I couldn't come to a community meeting, even though I was a member of CCRP, because we were doing too much advocacy. And he wanted the community to be there so we could educate didn't need our advocacy. The community stood up and said, wait, wait. <coughs> TIA is Midwest Immigrant Rights Center. They're part of this coalition. You can't meet without all of us. And so the collaboration and the coordination between law, community-based groups, city, state, um, really provided that foundation, which we see the fruits of here. And I uh, want to hear the rest of the stories from our friends here. But, uh, but thank you for letting me reminisce about that.